86% of high school students graduated in the year 2019. If you'll take a look at this map, most states have an over 80% graduation rate. So with this, you would expect that they would have certain skills that they've acquired throughout this process, things that they can take into the real world. But if we ask college professors to evaluate their performance in these skills, we'll notice that actually a very small percentage of them are proficient in things like critical thinking and problem solving. So what seems to be the problem? And how can we fix it? After all, the United Nations has set forward a goal for us to have equitable learning with lifelong education. But based on what I just showed you, does it look like we're doing lifelong learning in high schools? I'm not so sure. But what is the answer to this? I'm Alex Kuma, and I'm here to tell you the path of research, how it has helped me become more fulfilled and more and better at critical thinking and problem solving, but also how you can use it to advance your abilities and your critical thinking skills. But what is research? Well, most people envision research as sitting in a lab and doing lab work, just frustrated, just reading a stack of papers, often to no avail. Well, does it have to be this way? No. This is what research looks like for me. Working as a team on an innovative project while solving a real world problem, all at the same time. But how do we get to this point? What does research even do for us? Well, here I've developed what I like to call the seven tenets of research and how research can help you develop your problem solving. In a nutshell, it, research helps you adjust your mindset so that you can become a better critical thinker and problem solver. So let's get into that. What do I mean by mindset? How do we develop this mindset? Well, first we need to understand our resources and our most important one, which is time. We need to be using our time intentionally. So what's going on right now? Well, the CDC predicts that children eight to 10 years old spend an average of six hours per day on entertainment media. And this number actually jumps to a whopping 7.5 hours per day when those kids reach 15 to 18 years old. I'm not here to bash anyone for using their phones for this long because Quite frankly, I do too, but I'm asking you to be conscious of what you're doing and whether you're being intentional with your time. That's pretty much the takeaway here, just to be intentional. So now, how can we take this intention and develop it a step further? How can we turn this into ambition? And how can we grow our ambition? To do this, I want to take you down to the molecular level. By a show of hands, who here has heard of the hormone dopamine? Essentially, it's the hormone that causes you to want something. When dopamine is released in your brain, it triggers an urge to act, kind of like you see right here. But why is that important? How does it relate to research? Well, it relates to the concepts of instant and delayed gratification. Who knows what those are? Great, so instant gratification happens when you get simultaneous, when you get a series of spikes in your hormone levels and it's just kind of instant, and it goes back down soon after. Whereas delayed gratification happens when dopamine goes over a long time. But who cares, right? How does this relate to research? Well, when you're engaging in a research project, what you're doing is you're going for a long-term goal, which sounds a lot like this process here, right? This dopamine process building over a longer period of time, which is actually better than our instantaneous gratification of mindless scrolling on our phones all day. So what is research's role in growing our ambition? It helps us take us to the present moment so that we can develop our long-term gratification and our ambition, once you get it started, you get the ball rolling and you keep growing it. So what's the third step? What's the last step to really getting this mindset and then applying it to a research scenario? Well, have you ever been frustrated that a printer isn't working? I know I have. You know what I used to do? I used to press print 80 times and hope one of them worked. Well, 
I would end up like this guy, frustrated, because it doesn't, and I just want to break my printer now. But a better approach looks like this. You notice there's a problem, and then you look up, what could be the issue? And then you try to fix it. You change a setting in your printer, and you see if it works. If it doesn't, and it doesn't print your paper, then you change something else. And you keep doing this until you eventually solve your problem. So how is this research? Well, in a similar way, when you engage in a research project, you're constantly being prone with different scenarios and different situations that you need to adapt to. So in adapting to these scenarios, we're developing our ability to critically think about points. And by developing an adaptive mindset, we can become better problem solvers. So now we have the mindset, but how do we take this and how do we apply it? Well, the scientific method states that the first step is to ask a question. But where do we even know to begin? How do we know what questions to ask? It all starts from a mere video or an article that you read online. If this article interests you, then you can develop a question. And once you have that question, you can search it up. When you search things up and you do your research, you'll, get, you'll end up with answers, but in reality, you'll actually end up with even more questions. So this buildup of questions actually forms a network in your brain, which is really important because well, you're developing your discipline and your curiosity at the same time. The discipline to stay asking questions, to keep seeking answers, but also your curiosity in that you're actually asking questions that you want to know the answers to. So now we know about asking questions, but who cares, right? Who cares about this network that we're building in our brain? Well, say you're this spider right here. What is this spider doing? It's building a web. This spider takes in its food, and it digests it, and it processes it, and it uses it to build more web. Now, much like this spider, we constantly learn. We take in new information, and we use it to build our network in our brain. Now, to the right here, you'll see this picture. And this picture is from a few years ago, where me and a few other teammates in a research project were pitching an idea to the Chandler Chamber of Commerce. We were there to form connections to get their feedback on our idea. So in this way, we're forming connections between different ideas in our brain, but also between people. So we have two types of connections going here. The ones between ideas, and the ones going with other people. What do I mean by connecting ideas? Imagine you're in a history class, and you're learning about the American Revolution. You're not really sure how to connect it to you, and quite frankly, you're trying to, you're struggling to find a connection. Well, let's think about it. Let's think deeper. What did the American Revolution teach us? There were many battles, and one of them, called the Battle of Saratoga, was the one where France came and started helping us, and without it, we wouldn't have been able to win the war. So, how does this relate to my life? Aside from America not being here today, how does it relate to me? Well, I ask for help all the time, or let's say I don't. I need to be able to ask for help, and I need to learn that asking for help is actually very important, and it can make or break the outcome of my effort. See, by finding this connection between seemingly unrelated ideas, I'm able to be more fulfilled and really internalize the information I'm processing. While doing research projects, you're constantly exposed, like I keep saying, you're constantly exposed to this new information that you have to adapt to. And oftentimes the solution to the problem lies between the lines. And you have to be able to connect points so that you can reach this conclusion. So you get better by doing, and by doing research projects, you become better at connecting different pathways. Ultimately, this is what will develop your critical thinking and problem solving skills. Now the second type of connection I was talking about was the social connection. First, uh, second bug analogy of the day, but first insect analogy. What are these ants doing here? 
They're transporting their food down a branch to their colony. Each of them understands their role in the research and in their effort. Now, much like these ants, we need to understand our role in the research process. By understanding what value we provide, we can better understand how we can contribute. Now, this is really important, not just for making the project more efficient, but also for understanding our own limitations and how we can push them. Once we understand our weaknesses and our strengths, we can continue to cultivate this environment where we can keep learning and keep growing. Now, I've said this a million times, you run into many different circumstances when doing research. And oftentimes what we'll encounter is this idea of failure. Most people think of failure as a burden, that they stack failures on top of their head like this, right? But in reality, we should think of it much deeper, much better. Once we begin to think of failure as the stepping stones for our success, that is when we truly become better, that's when we can accelerate our learning and accelerate our critical thinking skills. But how? Well, in the face of failure, that is what tests our discipline, our curiosity, our ambition, everything that we have been growing so far. And failure, once we can see it as not a frustration, but a learning opportunity, that is when we can grow the best. And that is when we can truly develop our critical thinking skills. Say for example, I'm developing this technology that's supposed to, to cater to a certain population. And I've made the programming and everything and it only works 5% of the time. 5% is not a great number, right? But what we can do is realize, oh, wow, I can really fix this. And then actually fix it, maybe individualize this technology, for example. And now it works 95% of the time. Do you see how by learning from your failure, you can take it to your success? We act like this guy. We all acted like this guy. We would better accomplish our goals. So now, let me take you back to our original statistic. We know that 86% of high schoolers graduate, and very few of them are prepared for these lifelong opportunities like critical thinking, problem solving, etc. Now do you see how research can help us narrow these areas that represent lack of proficiency in critical thinking and how we can turn them into ready people and people who are prepared for the real world and more importantly, people who are prepared to accomplish their own goals? I certainly do. And to take us back to our United Nations goal, by using research, we can establish inclusive and equitable education and lifelong learning opportunities for all. But to take it beyond this, we can use research as a tool to help develop ourselves through all these qualities that I mentioned so that we can accomplish our goals but also know how we can best give back to society. Thank you.